Hi, everybody out there. Um, can't see anybody, but I'm told you're you're there. So it's very nice to be here today. I'm sorry we can't be uh, uh, here in person. It's always nice for us to actually um, talk with folks and see the kids and stuff. So I'm sorry about that, but that's the reality of things. Um, so yeah, my name is Carl. I'm a professor at uh, McGill University in Canada, and I'm going to talk about um, some of the work we're doing on um, cellular modeling of the CEPD1 deficiency uh, disorder. And I'll just say, if you have questions and so on, the best way to do is type them in and I'll get to them at the end. So my, the, the way I have set this up today is to really give you an overview of what we're, we're working on, uh, sort of a taste, a flavor of what we're doing, uh, you, know, you know, in depth enough, but without getting too much much detail and then we can really open it up so I've tried to leave a fair amount of room at the end so if anyone has questions I'm happy to go deeper into some of the stuff I talk about. Okay so the main objective of my group right now we're a neural developmental disease group you know and this is one of our major projects in the lab and we are our angle on CEPBP1 and why I'm here today is that we are trying to understand the role of CEPDP1 in brain development. You know, and obviously that comes up because there are two different disorders that affect uh, children uh, and uh, impact the way the brain is growing. So we have chosen, you know, just from a, we always have to make choices when we're deciding on how to study things. We have, we are looking at CEPDP1 as a dosage issue in brain development. And we've done that because there's these two different disorders, which I'm I'm going to guess you're familiar with one's called Schindel Gideon syndrome, and that's where there's probably too much uh, CEPBP1. And then there's CEPBP1 deficiency syndrome, which is the whole point of this conference, where there's, there's not enough CEPBP1. So we don't think that there necessarily should be in the same box. I should, I should really state that very clearly. It's more that there's a chance that they are. In other words, if, if one has got too much product and one's got too little, there's a chance that they're affecting the same systems during brain development and that we might be looking for mirror images, uh, you know, problems that affect, you know, there's too much of something in, the, in this particular cell and there's too little of it. So it allows us, it gives us more experimental control to look at things from a dosage model. And this is a, you know, these are, this is a real example where we have, you know, um, kids with both disorders and we can assess whether a, a, a system, a molecular system in a brain cell is affected in mirror ways. And again, that may not be the case, but it could be the case. And it allows us to um, set up our experiments in a way that we can be hopefully correct and reproducible in what we're doing. So that's just a, this is a philosophical sort of first point. Now, CEPBP1 um, was, was relatively well known in the blood cancers and it's, it, it's mutations in CEPBP1 that cause the gain of function syndrome uh, drive uh, a type of leukemia. So um, I'm not here to talk about that. Uh, I'm also not here to talk about Chinzel Gideon syndrome, but I want to sort of put, frame this for you. We, are, we think that we can use what folks have figured out in the blood cancers with respect to a gain of function syndrome that will give us you know, molecular mechanism. So at the end of the day, we want to leapfrog off what people have done working with this gene and with this protein and what systems it might be implicated in and to try and um, assess and validate those things in a brain cell and a CEPBP1 deficiency model. Now, of course, this is not necessarily correct, right? We could do this and it turns out we're completely wrong. Um, hopefully you'll see today that that's not the case, um, but this is just an approach that we have to take to try and minimize this. So that's the first two big points that we're going to use what people in the blood cancer have found with respect to CEPBP1. And we're going to assess CEPBP1 dosage um, uh, in, within that framework. All right, so there's three real goals uh, in my group with respect to the CEPBP1 um, uh, project. And this is, you know, there's really one major student in my lab, Lily, who's done the majority of this work, but obviously we're a relatively large group with a lot of technical support and myself and so on. Um, so the first thing we need to do is get cells uh, from children into the lab. 
And remember, we are a, a lab that makes brain cells from kids, cells that we get from the kids. Uh, then we want to ask, well, does this affect, do any of this, does CEPI-P1 dose affect brain development? And again, we can sort of model brain development in our lab. And then finally, we want to ask, uh, can we assess, uh, can we actually um, investigate the mechanism that the blood folks have found within these cell models we make? So the mechanism of what might be going on. So I'll walk you through some of this. And then, like I said, I want to leave lots of time where we can talk at the end. Um, so this is basically how we look at uh, neural developmental disease in my group. So we have, we, we collect pee or blood or skin cells. We isolate those cells and sometimes we can store those cells relatively easily, like the skin cells are easily stored. Uh, and then we reprogram these cells into stem cells and probably you're familiar or have heard about this a little bit. And stem cells are really, we're really turning, for example, a skin cell back into what kind of is like some of the very earliest cells in an embryo right after fertilization occurs. So we, you know, and this is a kind of a well-worn technology now, we did not invent this, we're just utilizing this very nice tool. And then we cryopreserve those cells. And just right off the bat, so when we get cells from patients, they're consented for work in our group. Uh, we are committed to open science and cell sharing. Uh, it's just that involves a whole secondary layer of consent. And we are actively doing this now, but uh, we need to reconsent people for uh, open sharing, which is in process, but is not quite uh, ready yet. Okay, so here's the patients that we have. So for the loss of function, we have two different uh, children, uh, as well as a sex matched uh, parent or sibling. So we think to get good control of our experiments, we need to have a family member who is the same sex. And this is just to minimize the amount of variation or kind of potential noise in an experiment. So we do that because of course they share 50% of their DNA, right? The mother gives 50% of the DNA to the daughter and the father gives the other 50%. You might say, well, all DNA is the same, but of course that's not the case. We all have all sorts of different little variations, and mutations that are not pathological or not disease causing. Um, but that can influence the way cells grow or we grow or what have you. So that's why we do that. In the pace, in case of the Shinzo Gideon syndrome, or the, which we're calling, you know, I'm calling GOF, um, there are uh, four different cases, uh, four different uh, children that we're using for this project. We also, for the loss of function studies, so the CEPI-P1 deficiency, We've also uh, used in this CRISPR technology, which is just a way to, just like a Microsoft Word document, to go in and sort of delete, you know, different bases. We, we have those made and ready, which is um, ostensibly a nice model of the CEPI-P1 deficiency syndrome, and I'll show you some of these data. Okay, so here's the cells we make. These are the cells I'm going to talk about today. So we make cells we call, we start with a skin cell or any, or blood or urine. Um, and, and for uh, these projects, it's both um, urine and skin. Is it the initial starting cell? We turn those into the stem cells, as I just described, and then we turn them into these NPCs or neural progenitor cells. And these are committed to become a brain type, but they haven't chosen yet what type of brain type to be. And then once we have this cell type, which is a real cell type that exists in a developing brain you know we, we we're, we're, this isn't some artificial cell type in a dish it's a real cell type that is you know in the steps of brain development it needs to be there it needs to expand uh, and proliferate so our cell division needs to occur and then that cell type can differentiate into for example these other cell types which are also well-known cell types in the brain oligodendrocytes astrocytes and neurons and we can make all of these okay so moving on so, uh, you know, is there a, the, the first thing we learned from the blood cancer people is that there is a probably, it's, it's p one mutations can affect cell proliferation. So the first thing we wanted to do was just ask in brain cells, this is this NPC step, which are actively proliferating or dividing cell type. Do we see that? Because this is probably a fundamental, uh, this can cause uh, brain development problems. And in the uh, Shinzel Gideon case, we do. And if you just look at the bar graph over here, this is sort of what the cells look like in a dish, you know, very low um, resolution, but take my word for it, we can pick it up relatively easily that there's more proliferation in the Shinzel Gideon case. And when we look at the loss of function, 
we can also pick up, you know, there are less cells dividing and growing in the neural progenitor cell state. So right away, we're able to, 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 to use what we know from the, um, from the leukemia studies and say, look, this, there is a mirror image effect happening um, uh, where we're getting less proliferation in the CPP1 deficiency and more in the GOF gain of function group. So that alone, can lead to a lot of uh, problems downstream. So this, these, this cell type, these NPCs are, are present around one month gestation and they need to expand. And then they become these other cell types that I described at the beginning. So having too much or too little does not necessarily mean your brain size is gonna be small or big. It just means that the cell is gonna have, to, the, 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 the system is gonna have to cope with it. And there's many, many, many different ways that a cell can cope with too much or too little proliferation. For example, neurons get, uh, brain cells get cold or die back in a normal process. So there's all sorts of ways that this can happen. But the question is, if this is happening, is, is, this, under, is this an underlying feature of the, the kind of phenotypes uh, you see? So you just saw a talk with Aaron Flynn on sensory processing, I think. You know, could this right here underlie part of that? Maybe, maybe not. Uh, we can pick it up and it's very early um, cell phenotype, as we say. The other fundamental aspect that we want to be sure of is if we, we were to look at the protein of CEPBP1. So in the, in the loss of function, that's the deficiency case, and the gain of function, that's what I'm showing down here, do we see that the protein's increased? And remember, the DNA mutation um, in CEPBP1 is going to, that gene, CEPBP1 is going to make RNA, and the RNA is then going to make protein. And the protein can be dysfunctional in some way based on the mutations that are present in either the LOF or the GOF. So what you can see here, if you look at, these are the matched family controls. This is the protein uh, of CEPBP1. You can see there's a little bit less of it here. Here's the control for the, the, the next deficiency child. And you can see there's less of it compared to this one. Again, these are the matched family members. And then here is our gene edited control. So this is just a normal person, uh, no mutation in CEPBP1, I should say. And we knock out one gene. Remember, there's two copies of every gene, almost every gene in the human genome. We knock out one gene, we see a slight decrease. And when we knock out both, we see a really big drop. And remember, we're knocking out in the DNA and we're picking this up at the protein level. So this is recapitulating what we would expect to see and, and is presumably present during brain development in these children. And then when you look at the Shinzel Gideon case, there's a very, very drastic increase, exactly as predicted compared to their familial controls as well. So we think we, we have a good model of, of the disease and that there is in fact mirror images, at least at the proliferation level, which I just showed, and at this protein level, which I'm showing here, just to give you an So this sort of validates that this model um, could be useful for our studies. All right, so can these, what happens when you have a set BP1 dosage? So now I'm, I'm not framing it in terms of gain of function, loss of function, or mutation here, mutation there in the gene. I'm now I'm framing it in terms of dosage, that whatever the mutation, sometimes there's too much protein, sometimes there's too little, and it's that fundamental aspect that is what's driving disease, too much, too little. So um, is there a dosage effect? So dose is you know, what, it, what, it, what, it, what it means. Um, uh, is there an effect on inducing cells from stem cells to MPCs? And is there an effect of differentiating those NPCs? Maybe that's that baby neuron that has to proliferate so that our brain grows properly. And then is there a problem in the way, in the way those cells specialize into these subtype uh, cells? And again, the, the way we do that, I might have a picture of this. No, I don't. The way we do that is we basically recreate the in utero environment. We give it the necessary chemicals and temperature and so on to tell it to become one cell type or another. So we think that yes, we are cells in a dish and there's no blood vessels and so on through these cells. But what we do have is we can recreate the growth factors and chemicals and, 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 and different um, uh, matrices that are required for these cells to grow that we know are present in a developing human brain. But certainly these are cells in a dish. Okay, so when we look at one cell type, this is called astrocytes. And this, this is an example of, of uh, loss. Of, so I, we have this for, for everybody. I'm just giving you sort of a taste of what we have. This is, these, are, these are astrocyte cells and they're stained with particular, there's a green color and a red color here. And they are, they are uh, color, they are, this is a way to detect a specific cell type. So if you see the color and you see it's present after you've tried to turn it into an astrocyte, you can conclude 
these cells can form astrocytes. And of course, you could count these cells and do a bunch of different things with this purified cell population. And when we look at the familial control for this, we really couldn't see any differences. And you know, your eye can see that something, you know, one might say, oh, there's less green here. But when we look at the whole thing more quantitatively, we don't really see any um, effect on any of the dose. There's no, do there appears to be no dosage effect on astrocytes. When we look at neurons, uh, these are the sort of fundamental brain cells that, can, that, can, that are electrically active and fire between uh, each other. This, uh, we don't, also don't see uh, any effect compared to the familial controls. Here I'm showing an example of a Schindler Gideon case, so increased dosage. This is all, I'm not, there's no control here, uh, or sorry, I should say the controls on the, um, uh, not sure actually if it's on the top or the bottom, but sorry, this is, a, this is controlled, so that this here, here would be, uh, let's say, the patient, and this here would be the control, bottom would be the control. And again, you're looking at these, don't worry about what these names mean, they're just markers, cell markers that are specific to a cell type. So when we make neurons, we really don't see anything obvious. The only thing that we thought we saw from the Shinzo Gideon case, and here I'm not showing the loss of function, but again, they, they look very normal um, to our eye, is that it might have been a bit easier to make neurons in the gain of function or Shinzo Gideon case, but again, nothing obvious uh, here. And then finally, for that last phenotype for the loss of function case, again, it was it, we were able to make oligodendrocytes, which again is a specific type of brain cell. And here was where we saw something very obvious. This is not that uh, reflective of today's meeting or necessary, but we could we had a very hard time making the Schindel Gideon oligodendrocytes. And I'm just showing an example of, of the kind of things you can see. And again, this is a these colors are specific to these cell types. And this was interesting to us because there's a real white matter, uh, which is oligodendrocytes give rise to the white matter in the brain uh, problem in, clinically in these kids. So, but again, we were not able to pick up. Um, any major effects of the CEPI-P1 deficiency case when we're making oligodendrocytes. So let me just um, do a conclusion of this sort of objective. So we think the CEPI-P1 dose, there doesn't appear to be any effect on how, when we go from stem cells to, to, to these baby stem cells, these NPCs. And when we look at the level of CEPI-P1 in stem cells, it's very, very, very low compared to the brain cell um, to these NPCs. So we know, we, we think that as, as a gene gets expressed more and more, it becomes more and more important. That's sort of the basis of that statement. And it's very, very weak in the stem cells, possibly suggesting that it doesn't have a major role in the stem cells. So our induction was okay. Um, when we look at the dose, there doesn't appear to be any problem in making neurons or astrocytes or oligodendrocytes for the CEPI-P1 deficient patients, but there does seem to be a very major issue in making oligodendrocytes for the increased dosage of CEPI-P1. So at least using a, you know, it's a relatively simple model, but it's not trivial to make these. It looks like the cells are developing normally, notwithstanding the fact that we had this slight um, decrease in proliferation in the CEPI-P1 deficiency and increase in the um, gain of function. So you can you know, notwithstanding that uh, that effect. Okay, let me just finalize with our last part here and then we can get to some uh, questions. So mechanistically, can we figure out what's going on? Um, and I just wanna briefly share one thing with you here. Um, in blood, we know that there's a very important gene that can drive uh, how cells uh, proliferate or divide and that's a gene called uh, AKT. Um, and that, that gene, this thing in pink, I have a cartoon, it has to get a chemical tag added to it for it to be um, active. And what's amazing about this gene, again, this is all cancer stuff from even the 70s and 80s. Um, what's amazing about AKT is that if this, this chemical group, which I just call IFP attached to it, is that these numbers just reflect different sites in, the, in, the, in this AKT protein. If those aren't there, the cell does not divide. So it's a very powerful um, driver of, of cancers and just how cells proliferate. And what's interesting is that this, this chemical group can be cut off by a different protein. And of course, the interest to us is the fact that CETBP1 can affect the scissors that cut this yellow P tag. So I know that's quite detailed, but there's no real other way to get into some of this without trying to share some of this, uh, the actual data here with you. So this is just a model of what the loss of function and gain of function would look like. So this is what we think in CEPI-P1 deficiency is that you're getting too little um, 
of the yellow P here because you're getting too much cutting happening. Set BP1 is no longer blocking the scissors because there's not enough set BP1 to block the scissors, which cut this, which leads to that lower proliferation rate. So that's basically our model. Um, appreciating that's quite technical. So I kind of want to, let me just show you the basic take home of this. I appreciate people are not used to looking at this is that we could really see this. And I think this is what I'm trying to show here in our loft. When we look at that exact yellow tag at one position, if you just compare this and this, here's the control and the loss of the CEPI P1 deficient case. Here's the next control with their, with the defected child CEPI P1. You see how this, this is a bit less intense than this one. And then here's our engineered knockout. You can see there's quite intense black staining, a little bit less in our engineered 1G knockout. And then it's almost completely gone from the, you know, the double knockout of CEPI P1. So this, just this alone is telling us that when we mess, like there's an effect on set BP1 dosage, you can completely affect this particular marker, which all the cancer people know to be a critical driver of cell proliferation. And of course, I'm, I'm showing this because we do, we do actually see the opposite in the um, gain of function cases. So we think this is very, very powerful evidence that uh, set BP1 dose is critical on proliferation. I showed that at the beginning. And then two, that at least this critical output marker is, is likely to be a player or could be important. It doesn't mean that CEPI-P1 is driving it directly. We can't prove that, but th at least we're able to detect this. And it gives us a very nice molecular marker of, of what to look for using cells in a dish. So it, it's an output measure potentially of CEPI-P1 dose. And that's why this becomes critical. Um, when we want to get a little bit more direct uh, about our hypotheses, we very thankfully have a drug that can block the interaction of CEPI-P1 and PP2A. And um, uh, that, uh, that gives us specificity of mechanism. Um, so we think we have got that because we can reverse some of these effects that I showed. And let me show you in the, um, this is just showing a dose effect of the drug, which again is specific to this molecular system. And if we look at all of our patients, we are in fact able to reduce it exactly as we are predicted. This is four different people. Vehicle just means uh, no drug essentially. And then here's the drug. So we, we think that we are really able to go in and do this. So the, 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 the big picture here is just that not only is there a relationship between CEPI-P1 dosage and how a cell divides or proliferates, but that there is an output marker we can detect that's called AKT. Um, that's what I just showed previously, and that we do have specificity of where set PP1 is acting via this drug and showing that it's, it's PP2A is having this important effect. So that model that I showed in those cartoon bubbles, um, again, we can't prove every single last link, but that it is very likely to be important in this uh, disease. Okay, let me conclude with this and then I'm gonna wrap, wrap up. So we think that, uh, the yeah, I think I just said this. So one thing I didn't mention is we have also tested that in the mature cell types. And I know this is of interest to a lot of parents. Um, we do not see the effect in the mature cell types, only NPCs. And of course, we're interested in the mature cell types because they're the ones that actually exist in a, you know, postnatally. Um, and we think that PP2A is an important player in CEPI-P1. Uh, at least in that very early um, neuronal cell type. Okay, this is my final uh, slide, uh, just, to, just to give people a sense of what we're actually up to. So CEPI-P1 is a complicated protein and it probably does a lot of different things in a brain cell and probably a blood cell and a lot of different cell types where it's expressed. And it does that probably just because of the way it's evolved as it's, it's just sort of takes on new functions and different functions and it might do this different things at different times and development. So it's gonna be complicated. Um, one area that I haven't shared today just because it's so preliminary is the epigenetic effects. I won't go too much into that just to say that the blood cancer people have two major thoughts on what CEPI-P1 is doing. And one is that PP2A pathway. I just showed you, and it looks like that's going to be true in brain cells too. And the other one is sort of managing how DNA is folded and wrapped up. That's called an epigenetic mechanism. And we're actively looking at that. We'll see how important that is. I want to highlight point two. We are uh, really good at making these mature cell types. I strode the oligodendrocytes, astrocytes, and neurons. We're very interested in doing our work in that and testing for reversibility of different output 
uh, measures, because uh, obviously that's of most interest to you know the therapeutic avenues. And then finally, I just wanted to say we we do have this is uh, specific to the gain of function or shins of Gideon, but you know we're getting a lot of expertise working with these cells um, and doing uh, knockdown type treatments for shins of Gideon, and that's an international um, effort to try and reduce the amount of set PP1 in no, that particular group of kids. And again, appreciating that's not what we're talking about today, but just to say that this is, these are set up, we have all these, um, these uh, collaborations set up with a few folks, which I'm going to show on the next slide, um, uh, uh, where we're, I think the interest to this group, you know, the set people on deficiency group is that there's teams in place that are already working on set PP1, who have a lot of experience on it. So just our, this is my lab here. Uh, so Lilith is, you know, basically did all this work and then a series of technicians that are very helpful. Um, but our international team in Italy, Germany, and Sweden are heavily, heavily involved in trying to follow this up, and that's funded through this European uh, Joint Program in Rare Diseases. Um, and with that, I will just thank you for listening. Thank you for coming in, and I'm happy to take uh, any questions from from everybody. Hi, um, Dr. Ernst, and welcome everybody to the SET BP1 Q&A discussion. My name is Lindsay Noonan, the SET BP1 Society Secretary. Um, and as you know, I'm joined here with professor and research scientist Carl Ernst from McGill University in Montreal, Canada. Thank you, Dr. Ernst, for your enlightening findings and helpful information about SET BP1 disorder cell models. We welcome everybody to ask questions in the Q&A box. Please remember to avoid including any personal health information on your questions just for your privacy. Um, we do apologize if we don't get to everyone's questions, but we're gonna try to cover as many as we can. Um, with that being said, let's get started. So I will begin with just a general question here. Um, Dr. Ernst, can my child join your study? And if so, what does that process look like? Right. So we uh, we do have active recruitment, and I can send a link to uh, my website where you can download the forms and the consent uh, to consent into the study. So yes, we're always open for recruitment. Um, the process, depending on what country you're in, uh, we uh, do need an on-the-ground partner to uh, work with us, but we have a lot of experience with that and it, uh, you know, how the cells get collected and then FedEx shipments. So it's, it's involved, but it's, uh, it's something that we can do and you should just email me if that's something of interest and then I can give you all the details of what that would look like. Perfect, thank you. Um, another one here. So I've heard of high throughput screening on cell models. Are you planning to do this to find potential repurposed drugs for the set BP1 haploinsufficiency cell models that you're studying right now? Right. So that's a good question. So that, uh, so that is an approach that people take. Uh, we are set up and interested in it. Uh, it's just that the, um, the high throughputs, when you don't know what to look for, that's kind of where you want to go. And in the case of CEPI-P1, I think our, our thinking was, actually, we know a lot about this because of these folks studying it in the leukemias. And should we start with a general screen when we might be better off looking at specific pathways? And I hope that the data I presented tells you that probably we, we should be doing more specific types of experiments because we kind of know what we're looking for, which is, of course, not the case in many diseases. So I am not, I'm aware of other people working on that technology, including on set BP1, or at least are interested in it, but we are choosing a kind of a more specific uh, tool again, to try and leapfrog and take advantage of what we know from the blood, uh, the blood work. Great. Um, we've got a really good question here. So how can we help ensure the set BP1 haploinsufficiency research continues in the future? Yeah, so I think this is a this meeting is a great start, right? The fact that we can connect with uh, parents and children, and I know I pre-COVID, you know, we we go to family conferences and talk to folks, and we my students love coming down, and I'm saying come down in Canada, it's often the U.S., so we, you know we go down to Boston or wherever. So that just getting groups together is is very helpful. Um, you know, uh, CEPIP One uh, Foundation's funding us through the million dollar bike ride. So I think, you know, Haley Euler's got this nice foundation um, set up where you can do your best to raise funds uh, for this type of work. That's helpful. 
but I think just staying in connection and contact with the group, um, and, and I include us in that. We're sort of partners uh, with the families, and we're, we collaborate. We're collaborators basically with you guys, and we want to know what you guys want us to do. So uh, by and large, you know, we have to do things in specific ways. But you know, if parents tell us we really don't like this, you know, we want to we want to know more about A, B, and C. Then of course, we're going to be responding to that uh, if we can, you know, as a scientific community. So I think having these kinds of meetings is important. Fundraising is important, um, and just generally getting more and more knowledge uh, about uh, CPP one out there. Okay, we've got another question that just came in. So how can we contribute to stem cell research? Um, so there's stem cell research, which is like researching how stem cells uh, grow. I'm guessing this question is coming from using stem cells as a therapy for disease. I'm just gonna guess that that's, uh, you can type in and uh, you, can, you can correct me on that. So, um, we do not see if that in fact is the question so i do not see um uh, using stem cells in a therapeutic way for for example cpp1 or any neural developmental diseases a viable path so uh, we are never going to be injecting stem cells and we can make stem cells right this is i can take a pee from your child or someone else's child we can make stem cells and so on um, and there may be some diseases where it's a good idea to be injecting things. That is, in my view, that is not the case for neurodevelopmental disease. So it's important to remember that we're using the stem cells um, for uh, disease modeling, the stuff I just showed. And then we can test treatments in these stem cells as a proxy before we start putting things in, in kids. You know, we have a rule, you know, we, I would never do something someone else's kid, I wouldn't do to my own. So that, you know, we're gonna follow everything in collaboration with the parents if we're talking about therapies. And I would never, ever inject my kid uh, with stem cells. And of course there's people doing this. There are actually labs that are like, oh, we can repair the brain with this injection. And like, that, that is, um, and you can see, I just said CEPIP1 is this complex uh, protein and it, it needs to be operating in a certain way at a certain time in development. Um, I think for CEPIP1 deficiency disorder where the stem cells are gonna be important is kind of for the type of work we're doing, which is, can we get more insight into the disease without going in and experimenting on a monkey brain? And we're not in a mouse because a mouse is not a human home. You know? So I think it's gonna be a modeling and therapeutic testing avenue rather than a therapeutic in and of itself for, uh, for neural developmental disorders. Great, thank you. Um, we have another one from an attendee. Um, in general, why does the research process take such a long time and what is the time frame to get results from your study? Yeah, that's a really great question. And I wish I had a better answer for you. So um, this, so it takes a long time because we don't have, uh, we have pretty good resources. Uh, you know, we have students in a lab and great infrastructure. And I don't, this is not specific to me, but, you know, we could have 100 students studying CEPBP1 and we'd still need more. Uh, and, you know, we could, we could handle, you know, the lab, my lab and other people's labs can handle having more people. So it takes a long time because there's not enough, there's not enough essentially money to, to do everything we want to do. You know, that means hiring more people to make more, do more stuff on this. So the other reason that it takes a long time is, uh, you know, when growing, when we grow these cells, it's, it's not a trivial process. So to make um, pee into us, just a stem cell, which is not really that is not of interest really to CEPIP1 deficiency. There's very little CEPIP1 in the stem cell, but we have to go through that to make the uh, brain cells or we think it's the, the best approach to, 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 to do the modeling. Uh, that process is like five or six weeks just to make the stem cells. And then we have to make sure the stem cells aren't what we call Franken cells. So they can pick up mutations accidentally. Anytime a cell divides, it can pick up mutations. So we have to check to make sure that things, that the model itself is still valid and it hasn't become some horrible looking thing and this happens. So I don't, when I'm giving these talks, you're not seeing all the sort of failed experiments and this went wrong and that went wrong. Um, so it takes a long time because it's, it's, it's easy to make stem cells and it's easy to make brain cells. It's just not easy to do it properly or to do it well. So that might be the purity of the cells and other things get in and so on. So there will be a hard stop on how quick these can go, but I would say the major rate limiting problem is uh, one of resources. That's a difficult, it's a difficult problem to surmount. There's a lot of deserving, from a government standpoint, there's a lot of deserving uh, 
diseases, cancers and heart disease, you can picture who we in the brain development area are competing with. Uh, and we always have to justify why, why we should get money and the cancer people don't. And I, I get back, well, it's a rare disease. Why does it, you know, you're only going to impact whatever a small number of people, whereas the breast cancer people are. So, I mean, we, I deal with this question all the time, no matter how good the science or results are, you're competing with other things. So there's a limited number of resources and that's going to affect how many people we can hire and how quickly we go in projects. And then there's the just technical aspect of, of doing it. But honestly, like, so this work was probably a year and a half, the stuff I just showed you. Um, in the right hands and enough people, you could have, that, that all could be done in four to five months, so. Thank you for walking us through that. Um, that wraps up all the questions that we have today. Um, so thank you everybody for joining us for Carl's presentation and thank you to Carl for sharing your expertise and participating in the Q&A.